Our next talk is uh, from uh, Veronica, Veronica Nada, which is going to talk about enough and how journalism can benefit from free software. Hi, everybody, <laughs> and thanks for being here. Um, so as was already introduced, I'm going to present to you a tool um, that shows a very concrete example about, of how um, free software can be applied to benefit modern journalism. Um, don't worry about the slides because there isn't much to see anyway. Um, you started? I started, yeah. Okay. Do you want me? <laughs> Uh, first of all, let me point you towards a problem that many of you will probably be more or less aware of, which is that freedom of expression and independent journalism, um, which are of course vital elements of uh, a free, uh, open and democratic society, are increasingly vulnerable um, and under threat, especially on, in the digital era. Um, because on a number of different occasions, uh, we see journalists, free speech activists, as well as their sources, suffer various kinds of retributions for defending the public interests. Among these, in the past couple of years, were, of course, the raiding of The Guardian, following their reporting on the Snowden revelations, um, the seizure of hardware at Germany-based data activism association Zwiebelfreunde last year, um, trials and retributions against whistleblowers um, such as Antoine Del Tour, the LuxLeaks whistleblower, for example, but many others. And then, of course, the killings uh, of journalists like Daphne Caruana Galizia in Malta and Jan Kuciak in Slovenia. So, one of the reasons for this development um, is a lack of political will to strengthen freedom of expression explicitly by actively supporting its advocates for example, through the <laughs> introduction of effective yeah, field laws. Um, and um, just to give you one example of that is that, um, for example, in the European Union, there are about one third of member states that have adequate mechanisms in place that would protect whistleblowers from um, retribution for disclosing information that is in the public interest. And whistleblowers are, of course, um, the most important sources for investigative journalists. And while uh, right now officials here in Brussels are currently trying um, to negotiate the introduction of the EU directive that would protect whistleblowers, um, this process itself has its roots rather in the protection of workers' rights than in an active strengthening of free speech and access to information. And at the same time, while well, legislative initiatives are, of course, an important feature of democratic societies, um, laws relating to freedom of expression, such as whistleblower protection laws, tend to be rather reactive than proactive. And in addition to, to that, um, legislative change is always a very slow and tenacious process. Um, at the end of which we usually also find a compromise that is unlikely to actually fully cover all occasions in which free speech or other issues can be disturbed or impeded. Which, um, for example, happened in the context of the European Trade Secrets Directive, which is currently being transposed into national law, where under the guise of protecting business interests, it actually allows member states to legally curtail free speech. And if we look at um, the political debates that are accompanying the um, whistleblowing directive, we see that the same might actually happen in this context as well. And then, of course, there are even more serious political developments in countries like Hungary, Poland, Israel, Australia, you name them, where increasingly strict media laws are being introduced to limit and manipulate public access to information and to consolidate the interests of governments through censorship. And so, in short, none of these aspects, of course, signal a political will to actively foster public access to information, but rather give uh, the impression that the culture of secrecy increasingly will outweigh a culture of transparency. 
Um, on top of this, um, the increasing commercialization of communication constitutes a challenge for modern journalism because just like the vast majority of people around the globe, most journalists like their sources. The, Excuse me? Do you have a problem with the selection? Um, I think we do, yes. <laughs> Sorry. The question was whether we have a problem with the projector. Oh, yes, we do. Yes, we do. Slightly. Which one are you on? Uh, so it's supposed to be the VGA. It's on the VGA? Yeah. It's on the VGA. Okay. We didn't have slides until now, it was fine. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, this is much better. <laughs> so, I think you can keep going. Ah non, mais on est sur le mien là ou sur le tien Sur le mien. Bon, bah, moi je l'ai sur le mien. Si tu veux un plug. Oui, mais c'est, en fait c'est la même chose. Moi aussi je l'ai sur le mien. Well, well, okay, yeah, I will keep going. So, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, so increasing commercialization, and the problem is that um, considering there is little well-established regulation on how companies may actually use data gathered from their users, the lack of independence provides a high potential for um, uh, to put free speech advocates, their sources, journalists, at risk. Now, this means that the defense of freedom of expression as a public value has to be supported or facilitated by another kind of social innovation um, than mere legislative initiatives, which would be to empower those who are affected directly. Um, because that way they are not only to continue doing their work in defense of democratic values, but they also put out a statement that current developments will remain well, are and will remain unacceptable in the future. And of course, one important element to this approach is the fostering of technology um, that empowers people, and in this case, especially also privacy-enhancing technology as a default for journalistic work. Um, because it would allow practitioners and their sources in the current environment to protect their data from unregulated access, um, as well as arbitrary attributions by state actors. The problem with this is, as we know from our own experience in exchange with journalists, um, is that many journalists and civil society representatives think of privacy-enhancing technology, but also technology in general, as something reserved for experts, uh, the tools that are used by a particular community, so the geeks, but not something to be used by the general public. And so the, in response to all of these issues, we started working on this tool called Enough, which is designed to um, address all of these challenges in one approach. And Enough itself is many things, so I'll just walk you through it step by step. First of all, um, it's a very easy to use uh, secure data sharing platform, um, which is modeled after more commonly used commercial services such as Dropbox and Google Drive. But based on the free software cloud service Nextcloud, which we're going to hear about later, like I think just right after, uh, where data is stored and encrypted. And now you should actually see a picture of the interface just to make a point about that it's very easily um, accessible and um, that a user who using Nextcloud, as you probably, I'm pretty sure all of you know this anyway, but um, don't have to give up on a familiar and user-friendly interface because the problem with journalists is that they are no technical experts. They need to work with tools that they can actually understand and that look familiar to them as well because there's also this psychological aspect that something that looks familiar is much more accessible. Um, the second element of Enough is the fact that it is a, functions also as a leaking platform because journalists who use the service can provide a link to their Enough folder, publish it on their website, and then sources who would like to make information available to them um, can access that link and simply drop their doc documents because in many cases Sources have no time, they need to act very, very quickly and need something very easy where they can just say drop it and it, the documents are gone. Now there should be um, a um, screenshot of um, the link 
but we don't have that, so never mind. Um, and um, on that source interface, uh, sources can also be invited to contact journalists or human rights defenders through secure communication ch channels such as Signal or Wire to ensure follow-up communication because um, in many cases, just having access to the data doesn't really provide um, context for the journalists. It's like archaeology, right? If you take a, an artifact and you don't look at the surroundings and you don't know actually what it tells you. So following up and continuing uh, communication with the source is vital for journalists, but should happen in a way that doesn't put the source at risk. Um, thirdly, Enough is a community and network because every user of the tool automatically also becomes a member of an online community, which again, I'm guessing more, most of you are much more familiar with than many non-developer, non-tech people, um, with a shore where we have a shared forum and which is governed by a code of conduct. And um, this community provides a platform to exchange experiences and ideas in using the tool, but only in the manner members of the community see fit, so there is no obligation to engage with others. And part of this community are a number of developers who contribute to Enough as volunteers, because what we've seen is that while journalists, and again, for that many matter, um, many other people who aren't developers, um, see privacy-enhancing tools as something reserved for experts, there are actually quite a few developers out there um, who would gladly support people who are less knowledgeable on these kind of issues to become more so. And so the Enough community is basically an attempt to create a network between journalists um, who lack the technological skills and developers or other tech volunteers who can and want to provide support in acquiring that kind of knowledge. Um, and on top of this, uh, the volunteers also provide infrastructural support in terms of server capacity and that kind of thing. So as a result, this decentralized community replaces the centralized company running a service which makes technologically inexperienced people very independent from commercial solutions. Which brings us to Enough's last uh, element, which in my view is also the most innovative, and um, which would be that Enough teaches and adapts. Because when we started working on the tool, the main aim was to make secure drop, so a light iron Schwartz is highly complex whistleblower submission system, um, easier to use, because our experience had shown that due to its complexity in use, um, only very few media outlets and journalists that employ secure job actually maintain it properly, which makes it rather dangerous for sources, especially if they're under the impression that people know what they're dealing with on the other side. Um, but then it became also apparent that for many practitioners and journalists, this high-level security solution isn't actually necessary. Often. Um, the simple use of an encrypted data storage provider, a certain level of independence from commercial services, but especially also increased knowledge about alternative encrypted tools, whether it's stuff that works on their phone or on their computers, and some tech support in setting up PGP or how to use Tor is mostly enough to keep sources safe and also contribute to like a change in thinking and these kind of things. Um, and so it mainly depends on the issues that people work on, which means that ideally they are able to rely on a tool that adapts, adapts to, their, um, to the issues they work on, but also to their respective skill set. And um, so uh, enough answers to this by being adaptable to the level of security required, which means that users can activate two-factor authentication um, or start using additional tools, but also by providing them with a platform, so the community where they can inform themselves, seek support, uh, ask questions, and learn about how to make technological solutions benefit their own work. And this cannot obviously go up to learning how to set up your own server, your own domain, um, or 
to ideally how to use secure drop properly in case you ever should need it. And so to conclude, um, let me summarize the benefits of the tool and why we think that this is a good application of free software sol solutions to mitigate um, challenges of modern day journalism. Firstly, it provides a very quick and simple solution for sources to drop their material anonymously, which makes them immediately safe, safer, at least as if they were to send it through Gmail unencrypted. Um, Secondly, by encouraging learning, it demystifies the use of privacy and ending tools and technology in general, um, which empowers journalists to take better care of their digital hygiene and contributes to an increase in digital independence and awareness. It also allows them to stay on top of social and cultural changes that affect their work in the digital era and not kind of be victims of changes that they may not be fully understanding. Um, thirdly, it contributes to strengthening freedom of expression because by empowering defendants of free speech, we also signal objection to the current political and economical developments rather than strengthen um, cultures of secrecy and censorship. And finally, it also contributes to fostering the overall communal exchange that has been advocated for in the free, so open, uh, free software and open collaboration movement for decades. So I'm guessing that, or I'm hoping, when thinking in the bigger picture that at least optimists, if not most of you, will appreciate the idea of providing a practical tool that feeds into a culture of trust rather, um, yeah, and communal exchange in addressing uh, global cha challenges in general. And so this would be it from my end. If you have questions, I'll be more than happy to take it. And whoever wants to check out the tool is more than welcome to um, join the community, and of course, feedback is very, very welcome as well. Again, I, I will ask you to stay seated during the question session. Okay, uh, two questions here. Let's start with this guy. Uh, my question is, how do you ensure source protection? So against, uh, I don't know, servers, seizures, or, you know, Can you real, life, real life threats to security? You know, s seizing the hard drives, uh, you know, when it becomes real, what kind of serious protection are you offering the sources who accept to use the platform? I don't know the infrastructure, so I don't know what this entails? We can't really, I mean, if, you know, if someone goes and takes, you know, the hard drive, then that's usually, a, oh, so, so, sorry, the question was, or no, did everybody hear the question? No. Shall yeah. I repeat? So, uh, I am a source, I drop uh -huh. some information, and then, you know, I don't know if the servers are in Germany, but then the German authorities seize the hard drives and they just check everything. Uh, is there any kind of protection against that? Well, would you like so, to answer to this? Yeah, well, I'm near you, so can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so it's a rather technical question, I guess. I'm participating in the enough community. He's uh, a mastermind. I'm just talking. <laughs> no, no. I'm a technical guy in the basement. He's very humble. So uh, it depends on what you fear, really. And the first part of the dialogue with the journalist is to assess uh, what, what, they, what they actually need. So say you're very, you, you need absolute security because like Jean-Marc Manac, a, a French journalist who specializes in uh, French intelligence agencies uh, going wild, then you need high level security. So we would uh, set up a secure drop, a real one. With, uh, so actually uh, in, in the US, it's in the newsroom, the hardware is located in the newsroom but in Europe, we prefer to hide it because we feel it's more secure and there is less chance of it being discovered. So we offer this maximum level of security to that kind of guy. Now, there are other journalists. All they need is something that does not obviously reveal the identity of the person who sends the document, in which case we use Nextcloud 
with encrypted files server side located in France and there is no need for the person who drops the document to log in. So uh, it's not as secure as SecureDrop, but for this kind of user, we figure maybe it's enough for them. So you see it's really wide range. Thank you. Thank you. Um, how do you compare with platforms like uh, GlobalX, for example, if you compare? So uh, to technical level, um, I believe, and it's not a very popular view, that GlobalLeaks uh, is more in fighting corruption in organizations like governments or big companies. It offers a leak platform that the employees or civil servants can use to report on wrongdoing of their organization. And it could be used for uh, journalists and leaks protection, but not so much. So uh, there, there is a kind of different use case, I think, for global leaks versus Secure Drop or the Enough community where we specialize in human rights defenders and journalists. Well, on, and as I understand it, it's also the element that it, like it's meant to guide people towards using technological tool, tools much more independently. So you have this... Um, the, the, the learning element to it, which, as far as I know, GlobalLeaks doesn't do. Like, GlobalLeaks basically runs a service and, and, and provides infrastructure, but it's a cl rather closed system. Hi. Um, just a question. Uh, do you have or plan to have uh, technologies, uh, for example, to fight the watermarking in documents? Because as you stated previously, uh, often the whistleblower does not have time and the journalist does not have the knowledge. And watermarking is a terrifying uh, tool uh, in that kind of transaction to uh, bust out the, the, the leaker, as we've seen with Reality Winner, for example. Mm -hmm. So th there is a wide range of tools to fight that. The, the key is the person who uses these tools, they must understand the metadata data, data leaking, the, what is watermarking, what kind of tool they need. So you can automate it to some degree, uh, but not all of it. So in the case of, uh, for instance, we, we could propose a journalist to use MAT, uh, M-A-T, uh, or uh, there is a second version uh, published recently where it's designed to, re you take a document, you run it through MAT, and then you, it, it's clean, cleaner, but you still have to think about it. And so, yes, we provide tools, but we also provide some kind of technical exchange, so, uh, because it's, it, it's not just the tool. Thank you. So just just a minute. There was not another question was no, at was the no other idea. side of the room. <laughs> My five minutes of sports every day. <laughs> I just only did one question. That if I have a clue about technical stuff. This, this one website, this project, would be my way to help journalists. So it's, it's on all of us to secure the journalists. Yes. yes. Okay, so I understood that right. <laughs> so it's more, more the talking and teaching and enabling, empowering stuff. And also, so the other thing is that journalists also need to, like, be more aware of their own responsibility and, try and, and kind of... So it's basically, the idea is to create a bridge between these two so that people can learn how to better make use of their skills in order to help the other one. A bit of a less technical question. So I'd like to know, what is the role? Oh, Last, one. Yeah. Last one. What is the role of uh, governments and uh, social, me social um, media companies regarding this uh, protection for journalists? Are they interested to provide uh, tools, infrastructure? They come to you, they help you, they think that it's a good thing. 
Well, they, have they come to us? No. Not yet. <laughs> well, I wonder why that might be. N n no, I mean, from my ex own experience, I've been working um, in policy consultancy on in these kind of issues, mainly on whistleblower protection, but, you know, it's like the same, it's one, one environment. I don't see a big, like, movement of governments to foster, like, a stronger... Um, how do you say, like stronger support for journalism and freedom of expression in general. Like I, the experiences that I made is that, you know, wherever you can curtail them, especially in, in, in the context of um, protecting business interests, um, this is rather happening than anything else. So, no, they haven't come. That's Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.